what I thought I'd do today is take you on um, one research expedition. I'd like to take you guys out on an expedition we did in 2007. It was called the Agave Expedition. And I'm only the front piece. Um, as, as you can see, there were lots of people who contributed to it. But while talking about this expedition, what I also thought I'd do in this brief talk is give you a little sense about what we're doing when it comes to underwater exploration. Now, there's a myth, the, the first uh, interesting myth that, that really comes to the fore when we talk about working on you know, planet ocean is that it's been done. You know? uh, this guy right here is Alexander the Great, 300 and something BC. He went down in a diving bell. He had already explored you know, the ocean. Now, his scientific veracity, you, you, we wonder a, bit, a little bit about it because we haven't been able to reproduce his results. But over the, over the ages, you know, Christopher Columbus, Magellan, the oceans are done. Been there, done that, what's there to find out? Let's go out to outer space. Let's do other things. But the truth is, even today, there's lots and lots of stuff that we still need to find out about our planet. And the technologies that we use, uh, and specifically the technologies that I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, really can be classified into three different types. This is uh, something called Alvin. It's a manned submersible. It's the biggest titanium sphere in the world. Three people sit in it. It dives at 8 o'clock in the morning. 5 o'clock in the evening, it's back. Um, and, and that's one way we use to explore the world's ocean. Here is a Jason. This is uh, another robot which has a fiber optic tether going to, the uh, going to the surface. So operators on a ship can operate this remotely. Um, there are certain advantages to doing that because you have a fiber optic tether. You can get lots of data back. There's no person down there. You can take a lot more risk. And uh, when you want to take a leak, you can just you know, walk out of the van and go take a leak. <laughs> And finally, I'm going to talk about this, this class of vehicles, which are known as autonomous underwater vehicles. There's no tether. There's no person. And the basic idea there is you drop it over the side, you pray, and if the, <laughs> if the number of deployments equals the number of recoveries, that's good. If not, uh, you're having a really bad day. <laughs> OK, so you know, the, if there's one thought I want you guys to take away, you know, forget about me, forget about the expedition that you're going to see. It's, you know, we really don't know much about the world's oceans. Uh, what we don't know about the oceans, here's a great example, coral reefs. Uh, everybody knows in the Caribbean, the coral reefs are really declining pretty dramatically. Um, in the early 2000s, we went out with uh, a bunch of people to look at um, coral reefs. And the idea there was 90% uh, of the reefs have, have been in a safe decline. This is, uh, good, uh, this is news that everybody knows about. But the problem with that data is that most of that data has been collected with divers. And divers are limited to about 30 meters, maybe 50 if you're really, really doing something fancy. But these coral reefs exist all the way down to 100 meters. And that regime, just between 50 meters and 100 meters, has, hasn't really been explored. And the first time we went back, we came back with pictures that looked like this. And I remember the program manager behind me saying, Hanu, this is all wrong. I said, uh, Graciela, what's, what's wrong? And she says, no, 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 this is just wrong. And we were, it's the middle of the night. We just got it back. And the images didn't look this good. They looked much worse than this because we hadn't processed them. And I said, Graciela, don't worry. We'll process the imagery. It's going to look much better. And she says, no, um, we've been working on the hypothesis that the coral reefs have been declining. These are the healthiest reefs we've ever seen in the Caribbean. <laughs> so what was, uh, you know, I was like, oh, OK, so that's good news, right? She says, yeah, absolutely. But, but the truth is that even in the 21st century, even down to 50 meters, there's very little uh, that we know about certain phenomena, and we really want to explore them. And of course, you know, I, I want to continue that story some other time, but what, what we found out was these reefs were very healthy. What we didn't know, of course, was this is baseline data. Were they much healthier earlier on? And now, of course, we're monitoring them to see how they react. Okay? Here's, here's another example. This is a Roman shipwreck on the seafloor. Uh, we do not know how many beautiful museums exist on the bottom of the Mediterranean. Okay. We, know, we know a little bit about the Romans. They left lots of ruins. We know something about the Phoenicians, but we found the first few Phoenician shipwrecks while working with Bob Ballard and his group uh, in, uh, in the mid-1990s. But we don't know anything about the sea people. And so there's a lot of work still to be done just in that one field. And finally, uh, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, and by that, I mean um, we don't know the effect of the oil plume on fisheries habitat. 
we are data limited in terms of actually finding our fish stocks and doing assessment about them because we just don't have the tools and the resources to actually go out and, and do, these, do these things. So enough about that. Um, you know, here's, here's planet ocean, you know, even uh, until five or 10 years ago, this would be considered a really, really nice picture of the world. Um, there's one big problem with it. You know, the ocean is not just blue. Okay, there's, it's more than that. And what we'd like to do is, you know, we'd like to, when we're exploring the oceans, we'd like to do a simulation. Now, um, I, I have this conversation with my students all the time, and one of the, one of the key lines I use, which was something my mentor once said to me, is that there's one big problem with simulations. And the problem with simulations is they're doomed to succeed. Okay? So, you know, here we are. We're going uh, to simulate what we really want to do with this, uh, with this ocean. We'd like to drain the world's oceans. Okay? We'd like to take all the water off and show you what lies underneath and show it to you in very, very high resolution. We can have a map of the lawn cover in the United States, but we cannot see what's on the bottom of the ocean. And that's a problem. And even if we could drain the world's oceans, one interesting issue remains. You know, when we think about the Arctic, uh, it is not politically correct to talk about melting the ice cap. OK. <laughs> so drain the world's ocean, but please don't melt the world's ice caps. OK. But, but we would like to you know, simulate melting the world's ice caps. And, and why is that? Um, there's some very interesting science that you can think about doing when you're in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, this right here is something called the Gackle Ridge. It's an extension of the mid-ocean ridge which circles our planet. And what's interesting about it is it's the slowest spreading ridge in the world. And so that means it can give us insights into the planet's interior, which you could not get by studying any other uh, you know, mid-ocean ridge or any other um, feature on Earth. And interestingly enough, even though we have outlets going all over the place, the Arctic Ocean is pretty isolated from the rest of the world's ocean. Now, before our trip in 2007, in, um, in just 2001 and 2004, I believe, uh, a couple of expeditions had gone out, and they had been making some uh, sampling there. And to their surprise, they found evidence of hydrothermal vents in the Arctic. Now, people hadn't expected that, but from a Science standpoint, what's exciting about that is we know that hydrothermal vents is you know, one of the first places where uh, life evolved on this planet. And then think about the perfect high school science experiment. You know, you've got the very origins of life, and then you're going to isolate them for 25 million years and see how they evolve independently. So there was a nice little race on to see. We know there are hydrothermal vents there. Can we find them? And if we can find them, of course, they're biologists. They want to sample them. Can we sample them? Can we do some DNA analysis? And can we figure out what's, what's going on there? Okay, so there was some really, science, really interesting science that was driving all this stuff. Okay, so now, unfortunately, there's, like I said, we, you know, how do we go about simulating the world's, uh, you know, melting the ice cap? Well, you can go out on an icebreaker, which is the biggest ship I've been on, and I've been on several, but there are some very interesting challenges about working in, uh, in, in, in the Arctic. Uh, unlike uh, some other countries, uh, it is our strong belief that given the vagaries of nature in this area, we would not use a manned submersible. Okay? We would have to use something which is robotic. And so here is the basic idea. You, know, you take a robot. It's, uh, you know, it's a small thing. It's about this big. Uh, you go out to where you're interested in looking at. You make a hole in the ice. You drop the vehicle in. It goes down 13,000 feet. Uh, it goes out, does its mission, and as it's doing its mission, which probably will last a day, uh, um, people don't realize, but the entire Arctic ice is moving, and it's moving at the rate of about half a mile an hour. And as it's moving away, the hole closes, winds come up, your icebreaker has drifted you know, 10 kilometers away. And then when it's time for the robot to come up, you send up a helicopter, you go find another hole in the ice, you drive the icebreaker to it, you drive the robot to it, what could go wrong? So, you know, and, and when I talk about all these difficulties, there's, there is a couple of other interesting things that happen. One of them is that when you're in the Arctic, especially when you're there in the summer, uh, there, it's, uh, it's, there's 24 hours of daylight, okay? And so, you know, sleep is for the week, you know, uh, especially when you have an infinite supply of espresso. And what came out of that is what I'm going to talk about. 
Okay, so here we are. This is um, this is a good day. Uh, you know, you can see we're on this icebreaker. There's a beautiful pool. There's a robot right out there, and um, and we, you know, everything's hunky dory. Okay, and when that happens, here's here's a example of a movie. What you're hearing is the robot talking to us. One of the big problems we have on the water is that light doesn't travel, which means no GPS, uh, no electromagnetic radiation at all, no Wi-Fi. Everything is done with sound, with acoustics. Now, here's, here's another day when you know, things didn't work as well as we thought they would. Okay, so I talked about some of the merits and, uh, of, of working underwater. One of the figures of merit is, you know, did the number of recoveries equal the number of deployments? And I can report this. It's easier to do three years after the fact that in our case, that was definitely true. Here's another figure of merit for at least the technical part of things, and that is how boring was the technology? Did it just work? And you know, I am still striving to go on a boring cruise. And so yeah, here's, here's what happened in this case. So what happened was that uh, we were in a spot where the ice had completely closed up on us. We knew the vehicle was less than 100 meters away, but we couldn't find it. I was walking down, so we're searching. There's an avalanche beacon on the vehicle. We're searching for it. And luckily, we saw this little yellow dot. Uh, John, if you go between that, I can see the hook. Good eye. Oh. <laughs> Got it? Got it. All right. Let me yeah, some ice. Okay. John, bring it in between the ice floors. Yep. There you go. Take a look. Hold that. Should we bring you in a bit? No, no, no. Just no, hold no. that. We're going to come right up when I move this floor. Okay, up. Up. Come in. So the big question then is, yeah, we talked about the technology, but what did we really find? And uh, so I'm going to show you a clip of a movie. This was taken by one of our towed vehicles uh, and um, from that expedition. So what you're seeing here is uh, when we actually put this imagery out, um, we're actually trying to sample what's on the bottom. We put this imagery out. We were also broadcasting it across the ship so that the ship's crew could see it in real time. And I remember very vividly the captain uh, coming up to me and saying, Hanu, I have been going to the Arctic uh, on this icebreaker for 20 years. And it's amazing that you know, it's such a beautiful environment. But for the first times in our lives, we're actually seeing what lies on the seafloor below us. And that was actually interesting for me to think about, which was that you know, here are these people who are really the pioneers in terms of exploring the Arctic, but we still haven't really understood what's going on. Uh, there was another reaction. Um, you know, we were do when we were doing this, we were actually trying to do some biology. And the chief scientist was Rob Sohn, who's a geologist. And when he saw this, he, came, he jumped out of his skin and came running down. And he said, Hanu, this is absolutely fantastic. This is pyroclast. And I'm like, OK, great. You know, what's pyroclast? <laughs> OK. And, and he was like, we're sampling, right? We've got to make sure we get samples of the stuff. And we're like, yeah, sure, we can sample. So we're sampling. And, and what we learned is, is the following that you know, conventional wisdom said that when we had volcanism, and we knew these were volcanoes because that's what we were looking at, that when we have volcanism in the deep ocean, it's a little bit like squeezing toothpaste out of, um, out of a tube. You'd have these lava flows coming out, but that's, that's the way it would be. Nobody until you know, 2007 really believed that in the deep ocean, here we are at 4,100 meters, uh, that we would have enough force to overcome the pressure of the water above us to allow us to have a volcanic eruption, an explosive eruption. And by getting samples, they actually analyzed uh, the glass. This is one piece of this little small black stuff. And, you know, and the results were, uh, were really quite revolutionary in, in 
in our understanding of that stuff. Uh, here's, uh, here's another example. Um, here's more footage from the seafloor. And what you're seeing here are microbial mats. Um, this is yellow, flocculent stuff just sitting right next to this freshly formed lava. And when we first saw this, there was just like a lot of head scratching. Uh, we, were, we were out there to find hydrothermal vents. We didn't find them, okay? And for a lot of us, that was a dis disappointment. But the fact that we found something that we had absolutely no idea that uh, even existed there was also you know, part of this myth that we need to uh, really understand. Yes, we're trying to do a hypothesis-driven science, but we're still at the stage in certain parts of exploring our planet where we really need to just explore and look and see what's out there. So when we actually, we sampled that too, they could actually culture it in the lab, and when they did the culture, what they realized is they found uh, a dozen new uh, microbial species. And, and that was absolutely wonderful news. Okay, uh, my last slide, and what I'd really like to talk about is, is the following. Um, you know, when we went out on this cruise, cruises like this, it's way easier to talk about them after the fact. You know, when you're out there, you're stressed, and uh, you know, you, you, your vehicle's been lost for 24 hours. We found it, of course, and, and, uh, and we have a television reporter and a radio reporter, and she puts a mic in my face and says, Anu, how does it feel like when your vehicle's lost? And I'm like, you know, you're gonna edit my response anyway. Okay. The FCC will see to that. But, but the point is, uh, you know, despite all that, uh, I think there is uh, a need, and there's a very strong need, for all of us scientists to really try and communicate our science, and to communicate it in a way which is completely, absolutely uncensored. You know, we are all human beings, we all have our faults, we all have our failures, but we need to expose those to the world too. And, and uh, especially when it comes to working in very, very rough and, uh, and ugly environments like this, by showing off our failures as well as our successes, that's how we will have the public and people like you behind us, and that's what we need to do. So thank you.